Hello, and welcome to the Westminster Confession of Faith Online. In this lecture, we're going to be moving on from the doctrine of God and His decree into His works of creation and providence. In this, we'll be looking at the creation of the world and God's providential care over it. This is the product of God's will and power, the manifestation of His triune love and glory and majesty in that which is not God. Creation and providence are the outflowing of God's will and power. As we laid it out in the decree, his understanding of what the world should be, creation and providence is his work outside of himself to bring it into being. In this, we are going to be moving directly from the doctrine of God and the decree. We can begin with Westminster Shorter Catechism question 8. How does God execute his decrees? And it gives this answer. God executes his decrees in the works of creation and providence. So we move logically from this biblical foundation of the decree. God is the one who is infinite in power and glory, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He has decrees for the world, a desire and a plan that he will execute in time. Creation and providence is the means by which God executes those plans. Now, let's dig a little bit deeper into how these words are being used in the Shorter Catechism. So we have two works here, creation and providence. Creation is the initial um, making of the world from nothing. We'll talk about that in a bit. And providence here is being used in its most broad sense to include all of God's actions to sustain the world and to move it towards his desired ends. The decree of election is underneath this idea of providence here. However, often we will separate this out into providence, God's general operating with the world, and salvation, his overvening of his plan to bring grace to his creation, to restore it to its proper end. So in this, one is not claiming that God's salvation is not an execution of the decree. Uh, providence is here just being used in a broader sense. However, providence and salvation should be seen as a common work of God. Often we can have vague understandings of a secular and sacred realm, the secular being a place of providence and the sacred the place of grace. That is not the understanding of the confession or the Christian tradition. Providence and salvation have the same author. It is both God through Christ and the Holy Spirit bringing about his ends. And they have that same goal, to give glory and honor to to God the Father. However, we do separate them out as God's general movement with the world and God's special actions to bring about salvation through Christ. However, we should not be confused. Providence is also done through the Word, who superintends all things. All things are done for Him and through Him, as the Scriptures say. So in this lecture, we'll be looking at both the doctrine of creation and that of providence. Let's begin briefly just with an overview of what we'll be covering. We'll be looking at the rather short chapter on creation, which covers the creation of the cosmos more, more broadly and looks at humanity specifically, and then an outline of the nature of providence, beginning with the definition of providence, the relationship of providence to the cosmic order, how we understand the different levels of causality going on here, also the relationship of providence to sin, both generally and within the believer, and within the non-believer. And then we will look briefly at the relationship of providence and the church. We'll end the lecture with a brief reflection on how providence should factor into our living the Christian life and what resources the tradition, especially of the Puritans, has for this. I should note that this outline of the doctrine of creation and providence in this section is deeply in tune with the patristic church, the western medieval church, especially the Thomistic side of it, as well as the Reformation. Uh, there is nothing particularly new going on in this chapter, although parts do have a bit of a Puritan accent to them. Let us begin with a broad definition of the doctrine of creation before breaking it down more fully. What we're talking about with the doctrine of creation is the fundamental question that all humans must, must ask. Why is there something rather than nothing? What is it that this world is? This question of creation is in some sense forced upon us by living itself. Where is this place that we dwell? Where did it begin? What is its nature? What is its purpose? And in Westminster chapter 4, section 1, we see the biblical answer to this, God's own revelation of what this place is that we dwell in. It says this, 
It pleased God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, for the manifestation of the glory of his eternal power, wisdom, and goodness in the beginning to create or make of nothing the world and all things therein, whether visible or invisible, in the space of six days, and all very good. Now, there's a lot going on in this chapter, so let's break it down into its component parts. First and foremost, creation is an act of the triune God. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit all take part in the act of creation. This is reiterated throughout the scriptures. God the Father decrees creation. The Son and Spirit are the agents of creation. We see this expressed quite thoroughly in John 1, that everything was made through him, that is, the word of God the Father, or Jesus who becomes incarnate. Creation is the act of God. The same God who redeems us in Jesus Christ is the one who created the world, rejecting any sort of dualism between creation and redemption. They are both equally the act of God. Moving forward, why was creation put forward? And this brings us back to some of the themes of the decrees. God chooses to create that which is not himself in order to manifest his glory and his wisdom and his goodness. Note again, this is not to add to God. God does not create because he lacks anything. God does not create because he needs creation to be God or for any other reason. God creates so that his glory might be manifest. His love might be known even more. God does not need creation, but creation rests on the pure grace and mercy of God our Father. So creation is a triune act of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to manifest his glory in the world. This is the proper end of creation, and that needs to be kept in mind. Everything that happens in salvation is an attempt to realize that proper end, that in creation God's glory, wisdom, and goodness would be manifest. In this, we then get to the doctrine of creatio ex nihilo, or creation from nothing. This is specified in the section this way, to create or to make of nothing, the world and all therein, both visible and invisible. This doctrine is essential for our understanding of God and his relationship to the world. This is often expressed in the Reformed tradition of the creator-creature distinction. There is God, and then there is everything that is not God. God who is infinite, eternal, necessary, beautiful, infinite in being and wisdom, as we saw before. And then his creation, which is contingent upon him, which is sustained by him, which is not God. And this is the foundational confession of Christianity with reference to the world and God. The world is sustained by God and is not God. This is to avoid any ideas of pantheism, which would say all that is, is God, or panentheism, which would understand creation as in some sense part of God. No, there is God who is infinite and eternal, and there is his creation. If God were to choose to cease to uphold creation, it would no longer exist, and God would lack nothing. And this comes from the foundational belief that God creates from nothing, that when God speaks, the world comes into being. There is no pre-existent matter that God forms, as in Plato's idea of the demiurge. There is no other ultimate existence that God battles with to create the world. No, God speaks, and it is. God creates from utter nothingness. Some theologians have put it this way, because God speaks and the world comes into being, that existence itself is obedience to God, that God has spoken and the world merely was. Now, you might be so familiar with this idea that you don't realize there are other alternatives that have been proposed both outside of Christianity and within heretical branches thereof. Certain forms of ancient Greek thought argued that the world was an emanation of God, that God in some way, the one in Neoplatonic thought, bubbles over, and this existence is somewhere as a kind of divination of God, that creation is in fact not from nothing, but from God. You can see similar ideas in certain uh, theistic forms of Hinduism, for instance, that will argue that this creation is nothing but the bubbles or the foam on the sea of being. This is not the biblical understanding. God speaks, the world is, and it is distinct from him. There are other ideas that have been floated around, especially in modern Christian circles, arguing that God creates out of a primordial chaos. This comes from an over-reading of Genesis 1, arguing that in the beginning there was chaos and God has to overcome the chaos 
in order to create the world. This puts in opposition to God another eternal principle of chaos, that it is at the same time as infinite and as eternal as God himself. This idea of an ancient dualism between God and some other primal being uh, can be found in beliefs such as Manichaeanism and Gnosticism and elsewise. This is not what the Bible teaches. The Lord exists purely in himself, in love, and he creates without any need for violence or struggle. There is no power over and against God. Creation comes about by his sheer act of will. So this is one of the purposes of creation ex nihilo, that God himself is God and his creation is not. And there exists no other principle, no other person, no other being that stands on God's level. And this is important because the nature of existence itself does determine what it means for us to live here. That question I asked before, where is it that we exist, needs to be answered in order to understand what it means to live in this world. If something like the view of primordial chaos was the case, violence and struggle is actually written through the very essence of existence, rather than the supremely peaceful triune love of God. So, much more could be said about that, but we should move on. I did want to make one note here. Notice that in creation, everything visible and invisible is included. And this is not spelled out in the confession because the creation of angels is something that is mentioned but not gone into, as I mentioned last time. But the larger catechism does announce this is how God created angels in question 16. That God created all the angelic spirits, immortal, holy, excelling in knowledge, mighty in power, to execute his commands and to praise his name yet subject to change. This is to indicate that some of the angels do fall. The confession never specifies the nature of this fall, given that it is not expressly taught in Scripture. Just to note that the, the confession is once again going as far as Scripture does and not seeking to go beyond it. So we've seen in the act of creation that it is a triune act that is for God's glory. It comes from nothing. Let's dig into two other topics briefly. The first is this phrase, in the space of six days. Now, this has caused controversy not in the time of the assembly, but later on in the 19th and 20th century, as the church sought to wrestle with how to uh, bring together biblical understandings and various uh, controversies with modern science. And so this led to various debates of how to interpret the confession on this point. Is it teaching what would come to be known as 24-hour days, or is something else going on here? The first thing we should note is there is no evidence of any debate on this phrase in the assembly. It was put forward without any sense of controversy or concern, and that is because the doctrine of creation in the 17th century was not up for any kind of challenge or debate from secular science or anything else. And so this was not a well-documented element here. Now, one place that you should look to understand how to interpret this phrase, especially in PCA context, is the 2000 Creation Study Committee report that intentionally has a section dedicated to explaining how to understand this section. And in fact, there are multiple views of how this should be understood. Some argue that in the space of six days does mean a literal calendar day view, that these days are the same as the days we experience. Others argue that it is hard to determine what exactly this phrase was attempting to do, um, that it might have been teaching calendar day view, or it might not have been. The main point for this indeterminate view is that it was attempting to exclude a position held by Augustine that held that creation was instantaneous. So this indefinite view would say this definitely removes Augustine's instantaneous view, but it is unclear whether or not it goes beyond that. The final view is what I call the biblical equivalence view. This position says that when the confession was written, the assembly was merely speaking the same words as scripture in the space of six days and was intending nothing other than to say whatever the Bible means by this phrase is what we mean here, that no uh, position was being posited by this. Um, and Lethem and Van Dixorn seem to follow the biblical equivalency view, seeing the assembly is not taking any position on this. Each of these are uh, sensible interpretations of the history. We just don't have much to go on here. But just to be clear, the PCA study committee report ended this way. 
that this is what must be affirmed to be in line with the Westminster Confession. That since historically in Reformed theology there has been a diversity of views of the creation days among highly respected theologians, and since the PCA has from its inception allowed a diversity, that the Assembly affirm that such diversity as covered in this report is acceptable as long as the full historicity of the creation account is accepted. And this was approved at the 2000 GA and is the position of most of the PCA. And so just to put that aside, the space of six days is a debated point in our day, but it really was not a point of discussion in the Assembly's time and should be treated uh, appropriately in our present context. Okay, the final point on this first section of the Confession is the goodness of creation itself. It ends with, and all is very good. This is the commitment that God has created a world that is positively good. That as the good God spoke a world into existence, that creation partook of his goodness. God did not create anything evil. Therefore, creation itself has a moral quality to it, both visible and invisible. There is no part of God's creation that is lesser. This is against any concept that the immaterial realm is superior to the material realm. No, all is very good. This is a very packed section of the Confession, speaking for all of the doctrine of Christian views of creation, and informs how we live in this world, it informs our ethics, and it informs our teaching about what goes wrong with the fall, and how salvation will bring us back to creational unity with God. Moving from this, let's shift gears from the creation of the world more broadly to the creation of humanity specifically. And this will be fleshed out a little bit more when we talk about the fall and the covenant with Adam. But the confession does begin here in section 2 to discuss the image of God. So it says, God created man, male and female, with reasonable and immortal souls, endued with knowledge, righteousness, true holiness after his own image. So here, this idea of after his own image or the image of God is being filled in with all these concepts and therefore is both a moral and an ontological understanding of the image of God. Humanity as God's image bearers are reasonable and rational as God is. They are immortal, meaning that they are not prone to death in a natural way, but are sustained by God. Uh, don't think of immortality here as the eternity of the soul but one that will persist in relationship to God. They also are endued with specific qualities of knowledge and righteousness and holiness, those things that go beyond the normal animal world, that do not have our level of knowledge, that do not live in righteousness and do not have a moral character. And this is continued onward as humanity has the law of God written on their hearts and the power to fulfill it. So one other aspect of the ontological image of God here is the power of will that is unique from non-human creatures. However, they are able to transgress it, as we will see tragically occurs with the fall. So the image of God here is fleshed out in both ontological and moral terms. And we can move from there. They also receive a command. Not only is the law of God written on their hearts as some sort of conscience or understanding of general revelation, but besides this law written on their hearts, they receive a command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So in addition to this image of God as ontological and moral, it is relational to God in some way. Humanity is uniquely addressable to God and therefore is uniquely responsible before him as his image bearers. And it does give us an understanding of this at the end, the cultural mandate or purpose of humanity, which while they kept this command, they were happy in their communion with God and had dominion over the creature. Here we see the purpose of humanity in the natural state, to have communion with God, and there was the source of all true happiness, true understanding of God, following his commands, living out our life in this world, with dominion over the creatures. In later discussions in the Reformed tradition, we call this the cultural mandate, specifically working from Genesis 1, in which humanity is called to be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over the earth. Now, it is in this section that one could note a shortcoming in the confession here. 
it does lack a deep understanding of the relationality of the image of God that will become more prominent in the 19th and 20th century. Not that it is going against this in any way, as it expressly states that humanity is made in the image of God as male and female, noting that foundational relational element that is found in Genesis 1. However, it does not make much of a point of it. Additionally, the idea of the cultural mandate, while expressed here, is probably underdeveloped of the purpose of human image bearing. But this does not mean that the confession is against these things. It was just not a main theme of the theology of that day. And a full understanding of the nature of humanity would need to include it, not against the confession, but in addition to the confession's understanding here. So, we've seen the doctrine of creation, that God has created a cosmos, that which is not himself, from nothing, so that his glory, power, and majesty might be revealed, that he has made it ordered, and, and that he has put humanity in it as his image bearers, to live out their lives before him, to abide by the law written on their hearts, and to keep his commands. We'll pick this up again when we look at the nature of the fall and the covenant with Adam. Moving on now from the doctrine of creation, we come to Westminster chapter 5 on providence. And once again, I'd like to begin with the shorter catechism here. To the, in answer to the question, what are God's works of providence, the shorter catechism answers, God's works of providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful, preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions. Once again, this is a very punchy and concise definition of providence, in which God, by his works, his active engagement with the world on multiple levels, through his wisdom, his holiness, and his power, which always go together, God's power is holy and wise, his wisdom is able to execute whatever he decides, and is holy, his holiness is expressed in wisdom and power. Remember, this is the God who is infinite in being and perfection that we saw earlier in the confession. He acts towards his world in both preserving it and governing it in all of its ways and all of creature's actions. The doctrine of providence is often mentioned but very rarely understood. Providence is an act of God with reference to all created things which disposes them to his own will for the purpose of his glory as the end of creation itself, for its telos and its purpose. It is also exposing us to his long-suffering and mercy, even to fallen creation. So providence extends beyond the natural state of man into even our present day. It is his continual blessing of the world. In many ways, this question of providence deals with another foundational human question. How is it that God relates to what happens? both in history, in the natural world, in our day-to-day -day lives, and in the work of redemption. Or put another way, how can we think about events and the passage of time theologically or in relationship to the triune God? Providence allows us to do this, knowing that God in his power oversees and governs and preserves all things. Uh, Bavink put it this way, which I think is a good understanding and introduction to this idea of providence. God is no indolent God. He works always, and the world has no existence in itself. From the moment it came into being, it has existed only in and through and unto God. This is the foundational teaching of providence. Creation does not have self-existence. Its existence is always from without, from God's will, from God's power. If for a moment God ceased to will the world to be, it would cease to be. The independence of the world is a dependence on God. Now, another thing we must remember as we think through this doctrine of providence and its all-encompassing scope is that this, just as much as the doctrine of God and the decrees of God, is a mystery. We stand on the threshold of things we cannot fully understand, but can only know through God's revelation of them to us. Just as God's infinite glory and majesty, his triune life, can be revealed but never fully grasped, just as his decrees can be understood from the word but never fully comprehended, so his ways with the world are beyond us in many ways. This is, once again, a mystery, and we should approach it with wonder and praise and humility knowing that God is the Holy One and the Righteous One, and we come to this on bended knee, into a place beyond our comprehension. Theologian John Webster has put it this way, Providence is a mystery, and it is known as such. 
What he means there is we attempt to understand providence. We are understanding God's mysterious ways with the world, following his revelation into all the contours of this. So let's begin with section 5.1 that will help us begin to define providence and lay out some of the parameters of this doctrine. Section 1 says, God, the great creator of all things, doth uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things, from the greatest even to the least, by his most wise and holy providence, according to his infallible foreknowledge and the free and immutable counsel of his own will, to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. Once again, we have a very packed statement that I want to break down in this manner, that God's power towards the world is manifold in its nature. God wills the world to be, but he upholds it, directs it, disposes it, and governs it. What the divines are attempting to get at here here, is that God will execute his decrees in multiple ways, sometimes by direct activity, sometimes by the upholding of secondary causation, as we see later on. And he will uphold and preserve the world and govern it to its end. God is actively willing the world to be and to be a certain way according to his will. And that is complex and that is transcendent over all things. Now, in order to understand this doctrine of providence, I think we need to compare it to alternative ideas that would be possible. What are the different ways that God could interact with the world, its creatures, and its acts? And there are other options out there. In ancient philosophy, there's the concept of fate that everything happens according to a law of the universe that is impersonal. Um, One of the ancient Stoics described fate as a dog tied to a cart. He will get wherever he's going. The only choice the Stoic has is whether you are dragged or you walk there. That is not what is discussed by providence. This is a willed action by God that also takes into account the potencies of created things. The other option is that of chance, which is often put forward in our own day. In this idea, there is no relationship to a plan of creation. All things happen, and that's about all we can say. There is no rhyme, there is no reason, there is no end. There is no reason that the world is or will ever be, and therefore this world is just governed by chance occurrences and randomness. This is often the position as we move into secular modernity, that there is no overarching purpose to history, there is no overarching purpose to lives other than that which we choose to make. Either of these are very different concepts of the world than the Christian scriptures, which holds to the supervening and providence of our holy and righteous God. Other images that need to be set aside, I think, are popular folk conceptions of things like karma, not necessarily um, in its full understanding in Hinduism, in that uh, which involves reincarnation and various elements there. But some people seem to understand providence in this way of you get what you deserve. If you are nice to people, nice things will happen to you, etc. Uh, this is not appropriate. Karma in its full Hindu form is an impersonal force that is about moving through different life cycles. And in the folk conception, it is merely wishful thinking of some sort of grain to the universe such that you get out of it um, by some supernatural means what you put in. Um, This is not the doctrine of providence. Another alternative that should be set aside is what I generally call the helicopter parent God. That God controls the world when I want him to, but when I don't want him to, he does not. God gives me some good things when I ask, but otherwise he is not involved in the world. Um, This is another folk conception of God, not a thoroughly theological one. But this is not what providence means. God's providence is manifold and covers all aspects of human existence. One cannot claim, for instance, that God deals with the big things while he doesn't care about the small things. This is often described in this helicopter parent God. Well, God doesn't care about this small thing because he's busy or he can't. Recall God is infinite in being and power. God does not require energy to pay attention to big and small things. God can give his whole attention to every atom in the universe at all times without straining himself in any conceivable way. So these false ideas of providence need to be set aside. This is not fate. This is not chance. This is not karma, either in a sophisticated or a non-sophisticated sense, nor is this a folk concept of God who pops in 
when we need something. No, providence is God's willed action that his creation will be ordered to him. And notice the scope here. The scope of providence is all-encompassing. All creatures, actions, things, from the greatest to the least. God's view is on everything, and he guides it towards his purposes for this creation. One of the Puritans shortly after the assembly, called Ezekiel Hopkins, puts it this way, and I think this is just a quite uh, poignant way to state this. He says, Hence we learn that God governs the meanest and the most inconsiderable and contemptible occurrences in the world by an exact and peculiar providence. Do you see a thousand little motes and atoms wandering up and down in the sunbeam? It is God that so peoples it, and he guides their innumerable and irregular strayings. And what he's saying here is that the smallest thing, the dust motes in the air, are guided by God's providence. How much more the large things of history, the major events of lives, and even the smallest things of atoms and subatomic particles. God controls and is over and above them all, directing them, upholding them, and governing them to his purpose and to his will. And the end of this providence, just like creation, is for the upholding of God's glory, his power, and his goodness. But note here the addition of two other qualities, God's justice and God's mercy. Because providence deals also with the problem of sin and bringing sinful people back to God. God is merciful in his providence. He is also just in the way that providence addresses sin, both in the believer and in the non-believer. So we have here our definition of providence in which God manifoldly engages with the world for his will in upholding, directing, and disposing it in every conceivable way. How is it then that God disposes and governs the world? This is what sections 5, 2, and 3 are getting at, the relationship of providence and the cosmic order. It says this, Although in relation to the foreknowledge and decree of God, the first cause, all things come to pass immutably and infallibly, yet by the same providence he ordereth them to fall out according to the nature of secondary causes, either necessarily, freely, or contingently. Now here they are being uh, in some ways more explicit about what is meant in the previous section about the manifold nature of providence. God does engage with the world, but he is not the direct cause of all events in the world. Now, what does that mean? He is the primary cause. He is the creator. He sets it all in motion, and he oversees all things. Nothing occurs, yet the will of God allows it to be so, to exist in the first place and to continue forward. But the divines here are using a distinction between primary and secondary causality. God is the first cause of the world. He speaks it into being, and it is. Now, that world does then have existences within it, humans who can will, animals who have instincts, laws of nature, all these things still exist, and God allows them to run their course as secondary causes. What we're saying here is there's a fundamental different relationship between God and the creation than any part of that creation to any other part. God's relationship is transcendent over his creation, while inside creation, the causes that we normally think of are not all there are. When you think of a cause and effect, what comes to mind? Most likely, what you thought of was the dominoes, that you hit a domino and the rest fall cause and effect. However, this is a rather simplistic view of causality that largely comes in a post-scientific world, especially post-Newton, that puts the world down to physical causes without understanding the complexities thereof. The divines and most of the medieval thinkers argue that causality was actually much more complex than that. Yes, that is how physical causes work. You can think of billiard balls or dominoes. That is a type of cause, but that is not the only way to conceive of it. God relates to the world as the primary cause, and he upholds the truth of secondary causality without overriding it. What we have here is God's will and God's causal power as supervening all elements of the world without negating their existence. So God's primary causality does not negate secondary causality, but firmly establishes it, as we saw in a previous section. What's going on here is different levels of explanation for events in the world. This is often called concurrence or compatibilism. 
God can ordain whatsoever comes to pass, while at the same time there is an independence, a certain divine, divinely organized and ordered independence of creational reality, such that creational causes can fall out necessarily, freely, or contingently. So God can ordain that someone will freely act in this way and they remain free. We'll talk about the relationship of this to human free will more fully when we get to that section of the confession. Fundamentally, God's willing and the actions in creation are never in competition. The integrity of creation is maintained without being in competition with the power of God's decree. God rather establishes the integrity and limited independence of creation by his decree. There is no attempt here in the confession to fully work this out into a fully orbed theory of causality, as some might have accused. They are using this terminology of first cause and secondary cause to get at this more complex understanding, to really express the biblical witness that God can cause and it can be caused by a creature at the same time. Again, examples of this can be seen throughout um, both the Christian life and the Bible. For instance, um, we can pray for God to do something, and then someone gives us exactly what we need. So, for instance, you can be praying that a neighbor will be helped by God, and then you can go buy food and help that neighbor. Now, God has answered that prayer. He just happened to answer it for you. And God has done it, and you have done it freely at the same time. Another example of this flowing out necessarily are things like the laws of nature. Gravity exists because God created it, and heavy things will fall by necessity. That is something that God has established by a secondary cause. Likewise, um, many other human acts, especially those in Scripture, are defined as being decreed and caused by God, yet at the same time being because of human willing. Most prominently here is that Christ dies by the foreordained plan of the Father, and yet those who do this do it freely and against God's moral will. So this is a complex thing, and the confession is not attempting to lay out a full theory here, but is noting that God's decree and providence is not at the expense of the integrity of creational willing or creational causality. It is not um, in any way that God causes all things in the same manner and directly. The only position that this section really rules out is an idea of occasionalism uh, purported by some medieval scholastics and toyed with by other Reformed thinkers, such that God is the direct cause of all actions. That is rejected here, seeing that God allows this to work out according to secondary causation. But our third section really does put a qualifier on this so that we are not confused. God is not limited to work by secondary causation. In his ordinary providence, he makes use of means. He uses secondary causation. However, he is free to work without them, above them, and against them at his pleasure. This is not just an element of miracles, or although it is that, but it is a statement of God's freedom over and against his world. Against any concept such as deism, or certain modernist views that would argue that God has created the world and leaves it to its own devices, the so-called image of the watchmaker God who winds things up and lets them go. And so God is able and does use means, but is always willing and could go against those means at his will. A clear example of that would be, according to normal secondary causation, a person will die of a given disease, and yet, through God's intervention in prayer, that natural course of secondary causation is not allowed to continue, and they are healed. That would be an example of God going against means. He can also go over and above means to establish something more than it could be by natural causes. These are rightly called miracles, and they are signs of God's power and his grace and his mercy. So we've established the basic definition of providence. We've looked at some of the complex relationships between God's willing and the nature of the cosmic order. But this does raise another question, and it's raised early on. What does it mean that God ordains whatsoever comes to pass? What does it mean that God does order all creatures and all actions? Would that not mean that God has some sort of relationship to sin? Some people seem to want God to be responsible only for the nice things, and to give sin a complete independence from God's will and God's ways. But that does cause several 
problems. However, with this understanding of secondary causation in mind, we're ready to engage with it. Because God's providence covers all things, from the biggest to the smallest, it does extend even to the sinful actions of creatures. This is expressed throughout the Bible. It is uh, God's permissive will that allows the fall. God uses the Assyrians and the Babylonians in their sin to punish his people Israel. God ordains that Christ will die on the cross, and yet those who kill him are committing sins. God's providence does include even sin itself. But we need to keep in mind this idea of secondary causation. God is not the author of sin, as we saw in the decree. As the confession says here, the sinfulness thereof proceedeth only from the creature and not from God, who being most holy and righteous neither is nor can be the author or approver of sin. And this must be maintained. Yes, God decrees that sin will occur. Yes, God does use sin even in the creation for his own ends. But God is in no way culpable for that sin, nor is he ever the direct cause of that sin. Sin falls out according to secondary causes by the free willing of creatures. Creatures are the source of evil. And this is important to understand. Evil does not come from some mystical place outside God's control. It is not some sort of independent agent or source in creation. No, theologians have noted that evil is ultimately a decreasing of good, a defective view of willing. So sin comes from the defective human will and rebellion against God. God does permit it, God does still govern it towards his ends, and God will always defeat it in the end. So God does allow sin. God does govern all sin. God does uphold even the sinner in existence, but God is not and never can be the author of sin. One does not want to give into the alternative position that sin has some sort of autonomous existence within God's creation beyond his control and his power. This would lead to a sort of dualism or even a cosmic dualism such as Manichaeanism in which there is an infinite principle of goodness and an infinite principle of evil such that God is free from all connection whatsoever but that evil has some sort of independent existence. Christianity rejects that all. God is the infinite creator, good and holy God, is sovereign even over evil but he will destroy it and defeat it because it is against his holy and righteous nature. This is how um, the confession describes God directing evil even to his ends. And that not by a bare permission, but such as hath joined with it a most wise and powerful bounding, and otherwise ordering and governing of them in a manifold dispensation to his holy ends. God can even use sinful actions towards his glory, even if those actions are rejected by his moral will. This is expressed quite clearly in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, as Joseph is saying to his brothers, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Joseph's brothers sinned against God according to their own free will. God knew they were going to do this. God did decree it in his overall plan, but it was still their free action. And therefore, the sinfulness thereof comes from their will alone. And yet God uses through his providence even the sinful action towards his plan. Now, this does bring up a broader question of um, theodicy here. How can we account for suffering and evil in the world? That is a much broader question than we can go into in this doctrine of providence per se, but a couple things to be noted here. Any concept of theodicy must wrestle with the entirety of the Christian witness of God's goodness, his mercy, his love, the death of Christ on the cross, and ultimately the eschatological destruction of all evil and sin. And so as we come to theodicy, how could God allow such things as the fall and evil? We ultimately cannot give a complete answer to this. It is by God's mercy that we exist at all, and that he is holy and righteous and good and will defeat all evil. There is no simple answer that can get beyond God's mercy and his utter infinite will for the creation. God is good, 
God is holy, God is righteous, God hates sin and deals with sin at the cross and will end sin at the end of time. That is ultimately our hope and our faith in the light of suffering, not a philosophical answer to the problem of theodicy. Although those answers do exist, they do not satisfy the existential need in the face of suffering. The only thing that can is our relationship to the one who is beyond suffering, who is goodness, holiness, and righteousness himself, God, whom we can trust to make all things work out for the good of those who love him, as he promises in the book of Romans. Okay, so we've seen in this, God has providential control and disposes all things in the world, that this does not work out through monocausality, but God works through secondary causes. He can work with means or without them. That God's providential ordering extends even to sin, but God is not and never is or could be the author of sin or sinful in himself. As James says quite clearly, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. Here we see James rejecting any concept that temptation comes from God, but rather comes from one's own sinful desires and will. Moving on then, let's look at, continue to break down this relationship of providence and sin in the believer and in the unbeliever. So this section of chapter 5 deals specifically with when believers fall into sin. This is not a full statement of the relationship of the believer to providence in which God upholds them, guides them, gives them all, in which we're dependent on God for all of our life, all that we do, all that we're given. This is dealing specifically with the question of what happens when a believer falls into sin. What are we supposed to understand that to mean? This will come up again when we look at the section on sanctification later on. This addresses that specific trial. Uh, we must add some general themes here from 5.1 to understand all this. God does dispose and generally live in the Christian's life and moves them to a proper end. He also cares for his people specifically through providence that we see in section 5.7. What this is getting at is how are we to make of believers falling into corruption? God's providence even extends to those areas where we fall into sin and backsliding. Through his permission, he allows these things to occur so that we might learn from them. It says this, The most wise, righteous, and gracious God doth oftentimes leave for a season his own children to manifold temptations. Notice God here does not tempt, but the temptations of our own flesh are not defeated. God does not tempt, but allows us to fall into temptation and the corruption of their own hearts, to chastise them for their former sins, or to discover unto them the hidden strength of corruption and deceitfulness of their hearts, that they may be humbled, and to raise them to a more close and constant dependence for their support upon him, and to make them more watchful against all future occasions of sin, and for sundry other just and holy reasons. So the first thing we must say about this is this activity is part of God's fatherly care for the believer. God does not allow us to fall into sin to reject us or to make us move away from him. He does so in his fatherly care that we might learn and grow. Let's break this down into what this says here. First, one of the purposes that could be the case, now this is not saying it always is, but these are things that could be the case. God allows a person to fall into temptation as chastisement, as a temporal consequence for their sin. Christ has dealt definitively with our status before God. We are holy and righteous in his sight. But in his fatherly discipline, he will often shape us and mold us by allowing us to see the, the falseness of our hearts. So temporal consequences can follow, but they are not the aspect of the father's displeasure with us, but a way to mold us and discipline us into the right way of being. And this comes in the second main purpose that could be the case for a believer falling into temptation. And that is an epistemic purpose that we might grow in knowledge. It shows us the power of sin that still remains within us so that we can turn away from it. We can move away from our pride and our self-righteousness and trust in God alone. 
So trials and temptations can chastise us to turn us back to God. They can give us new knowledge of the way sin is operating in us. But all of this is making us draw closer to God and to humble us before him, that we can learn how to cling to him more and more and be motivated to use the ordinary means of Christian life, of prayer, of fasting, of fellowship, of reading the word. And all of this comes through God's providence and his fatherly care and discipline for his children. The object of such activities are not those outside of God's family, but those who have been bought by Christ, sealed by the Spirit, to be the children of God the Father. Now, I should note here that this is not giving a full explanation or even a full theology of suffering and the nature of temptation. We do not get that fully in the confession. We'll see a little bit more of this theme in the section on sanctification, as I mentioned. But note the end of this chapter. And for sundry other just and holy ends, the divines are saying here, we don't necessarily know. God has many ends, and they are just, and they are holy. They are saying this is one of the possible outcomes of sin and temptation, or even various other trials. And therefore, we must approach this pastorally in a very wise way. They are not saying this is what is always occurring for clarity's sake. So providence oversees the sin, even the believer in God will direct it towards his holy and just ends. Section six then deals with the question of sin within the sinner and the hardening that goes on at this time. God will at times give sinners over fully to sin by withdrawing his gifts. We see this in various places in scripture, for instance, thinking of Romans 1, that the Lord gave them over to their lusts and their desires. He withheld his bounding of sin and allowed it to run full course in his judgment of them. It says this, he not only withholds his grace whereby they might have been enlightened in their understanding and wrought upon in their hearts, but sometimes also withdraws the gifts which they had. Now, this is coming through as God does not open their eyes. We see this in the ministry of Jesus. Some receive the blessings of God and repent and rejoice. Others hear Christ and they hate him and they reject him. Just as Paul talks about the gospel being the scent of life to some and the scent of death to others. Some are repulsed by God's ways and that is God allowing the hardness of their heart to occur. This section also talks about a dual hardening. God will harden the sinner's heart, making them more insensible to the beauty of the world, to his gifts, and to his graces. And the sinner, likewise, will harden their own heart. We see this scene, uh, we see this throughout the example of Pharaoh, both in the book of Exodus and as Paul picks it up in Romans 9, who continually hardens his heart against the message of Moses, and God is working on to harden his heart as well. So God's ends might be achieved, and Pharaoh might receive his just rewards. Hardening here is not an overriding of the human will, it is a removing of that natural and common grace that God normally gives to the sinner, that we are not always consumed by sin. God withholds his grace and even his common grace from some sinners at from some times, such that even those things that are meant to be instruments of grace, such as scripture or mercy or kindness, turn into instruments of rejection of the sinner. So God's power is over all of this as the holy righteous Lord who works according to secondary causes and governs and disposes all things to the purpose of his justice, his mercy, and his will. Let's move on to the final point here, which is God's providential ordering of the church itself. The divines do not go into great depth here, but they end with an understanding that God has a special providence and care for his church. As the providence of God in general reaches to all creatures, so after a more special manner it taketh care of his church and disposes all things to the good thereof. While providence is certainly universal, covering all aspects of creatures and their actions, God does take a special care for his church as the means of his work in the world and the object of his special affection. The church being united with Jesus, filled with the Spirit, is the vehicle that God is using to remake this creation. And so he does care for it specially, and we can trust this. The church, in some sense, as we'll see later in the confession, is the center of God's plan and his working of his will in the world. And it will be the church that will succeed and that will exist throughout all ages and will gain 
ultimate victory as a vehicle of God's glory in existence. And despite all the schemes of this world and Satan and the flesh, the church will prevail and the church will prosper under the hand of God. This is the faith that Paul expresses in Romans 8, 28, when he says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. This special care is not always that things will work out well in this life or immediately, but we have faith in God's providence, his care, and his mercy, that in the end he will bring all things into right relationship with himself. He will remove evil and sin and he will be glorified in everything. This is the doctrine of providence as expressed here. I do want to briefly discuss the use of this doctrine for our Christian life. While doctrine is often mentioned in asides in the Christian life, it is deeply neglected as an aspect of our spirituality and our lives. Puritans were certainly not like this. They focused on providence quite a bit as a means of spiritual development and thought. Sometimes they would perhaps go too far in their emphasis on providence, uh, looking for God's will in every little thing, which is probably not healthy. But to meditate on providence is a way of growing deeper in our knowledge and love of God. Um, one of the ways that this has been set down by a Puritan slightly after the assembly, John Flavel, who was a Presbyterian minister, um, after the assembly and into the early part of the 18th century, he wrote a work called The Mystery of Providence that lays out an understanding of what does it mean to think through God's providence deeply in our lives. And he gives four steps for working through this. And I want to advise us to think about this as we think about the confession. What does it mean to live a life that is cognizant of God's providential care and is not living in a functionally deistic universe where God creates the world but is not really involved with every moment of our lives? You see, one of the clear implications of the doctrine of providence is God is at work every moment of our existence, that his will suffuses all of our life. Even this very moment, God has ordained that you are here, right now, hearing this. And what would God have you do with that? And so, Flavel offers four steps to meditate on providence. The first, he says, is to labor to remember and explore God's providence towards us. This first step is taking attention, remembering that the world is God's work and God is speaking through it all. Trying to give our attention to concrete ways God is providing for us, is caring for us, is blessing us in every part of our lives. Not just in the extraordinary ways, but also in the ordinary. Every meal you have is an act of God's providence, an answer to the prayer, Lord, give us this daily bread. He has organized that you will have food today. It is a mighty act of God. Seeing God's providence, both ordinary, extraordinary, and realizing that this is God's mercy to us in all things. So the first thing of meditating on providence is to pay attention and to remember when we notice. How often have you had a prayer answered or God give you something out of the blue that was exactly what you needed and you forgot about it the week afterwards or two weeks afterwards? I will remember this. My faith is so high and yet we forget. So, Flavel recommends that we remember and we meditate on these things. We look for them and we write them down so we can say, God was faithful this way today. God was faithful this way. But this is not enough. We're not merely looking for these activities outwardly, but this is connected also to the Word. He says, trace out the connections between providence in our lives and the promises of God in Scripture, seeing how specific promises of God have concretely come true in our days. So one example of this is you think through the promise of God in Ephesians 2, chapter 10, that God will prepare beforehand good works for us to walk in, as we see as outworking of his grace and our faith. And so what works did God foreordain that you walk in today? What ways did God uphold you when you needed it? In what ways did you see Christ working in you today? And ascribing those properly to the praise and glory of God. So pay attention and look at the world in a new light. God is always at work, even in the dust motes of the air. God is at work in all things. Do we have eyes to see? Do we have ears to hear? We should pray for these, that we might know how God is working in the world. We must see our whole existence through this proper scriptural lens of the provision and the mercy and the governance of God in every aspect of life. 
The Puritans had a sort of everyday mysticism, not that sought to put massive meaning in all things, but saw in their meals the hand of God, saw in minor mercies God's mercy, saw in kindness and love the very love of our Creator. We need to cultivate this as well and set aside modern secularized views of the world that only apply to a material existence. And this brings us, us to the third point. The point of providence is not providence itself, but God who is the provider and redeemer and Lord. So look beyond our events and circumstances, the good and the ill, and turn to God, our creator and merciful one, to bless him and to praise him for his mercy day in and day out. This is a proper heavenly mindedness through our earthly lives, seeing all things from God's hand, seeing Christ's power and the spirits working in all things and giving thanks to our Lord and our God, blessing him for the sunsets and the trees and the beauty of a good meal and even for provision in suffering and for kindness despite very difficult times. And God will uphold this all. And then finally is a point of meditation to respond appropriately to providential urgings. According to the Word and the Holy Spirit, this is always bounded by the Word of God and the Spirit working in us. What does it mean to respond to providence? It does not lead to inaction or quietism. The Puritans were quite against that in every way. But what does it mean to rejoice and to lament and to act and to pray and to weep and to repent in light of the things God is orchestrating in our lives day in and day out? What do we need to respond to providence with in any given moment? This needs to be our call. I commend this to you as a useful activity that was a large part of the spirituality of the Westminster Divines and the Reformed traditions as something to think about. How is it that providence will affect the way we live our lives, how we view our world, and view even this class, perhaps? So, this is the doctrine of providence. And before one might think that this is done in a kind of otherworldly sense, know that the Puritans lived in a very difficult world. Their experience with suffering and death was much more apparent and near than most of us have ever experienced. Flavel, for instance, lost several children and lost several wives in this endeavor, and yet he could marvel at God's providence and his mercy. And we should do the same. God's beauty and power and glory in creation and providence is something that should turn us to praise and wonder and humility. And I do really think that the Heidelberg Catechism, question 28, gets at this quite well. While I think the Heidelberg Catechism uh, is probably not sufficient for a confessional document uh, because it is focused much more on the aesthetics and the pastoral side, which is all very good, but is not very precise, there are times where its beauty and its focus on the pastoral is deeply uplifting, and we can learn lots from it at good moments. And so I want to end with this. The Heidelberg Catechism asks, how does the knowledge of God's creation and providence help us? We can be patient when things go against us, thankful when things go well, and for the future, we can have good confidence in our faithful God and Father that nothing in creation will separate us from his love. For all creatures are so completely in God's hand that without his will, they can neither move nor be moved. This is our hope, that as we understand the way the world is, God's powerful execution of his decrees, we can learn to trust him as our Father, as our Lord, and as our God.